I want to talk to you today, the second part of this message on endurance, something that God wants all of us to realize as we try to follow him and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the need to endure. We're taking this entire series from a few verses in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, out of reverence for the reading of the scripture, if you're able now, would you please stand? This is the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's look first of all at the context of these verses. Again, to take a text out of context is pretext. What is the context of verses 3 through 5, the heart of today's message, verses 1 and 2? They imply a personal, living, dynamic relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. These verses are for Christians, those who have been justified by faith, who have been declared righteous before God because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And how do you know you have this faith in Jesus Christ? You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no longer enmity between you and God. Your hostility and rebellion against God has been declared forgiven. There is now peace with God. There is now peace in your heart. As you know, God is in perfect control of your life as you live in that perfect relationship with Jesus Christ. And also, we have access to God by this grace through faith. That means we can go to the Father anytime, any day, and ask him anything. It's much like a commitment I have with my children. No matter what I'm doing at work, if one of them needs me, they can call me immediately on my cell phone and I will stop anything I'm doing in the office and take their call. That's because since they are my children, they have access to me as their father. Similarly, to those of us who've been justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, God is now our daddy. We're his adopted children in his family and we have peace with him, no longer in rebellion against him. And peace in our hearts because we know his sovereign oversight, and we also know that we can go to him anytime, any place, and ask him anything in prayer again because he is our daddy. So please note these verses are for people who know the Lord Jesus Christ, they are in an intimate, personal relationship with him. Again, the Christian faith is not about religion. It's not about rules and regulations, going through a checklist, making sure we've done our duty to God. The Christian faith is about a relationship with Jesus where he's in us and we are in him. We can talk to him any day, any time, and he is sovereignly overseeing all of our lives. So in that personal relationship with Jesus, then we move to these remarkable verses in verses three through five. Paul tells us that we can rejoice in our trials and tribulations. We can rejoice in them. Now, this word tribulations in the Greek can mean pressures, problems, loneliness, difficulties, disappointments, rejection, betrayals, persecutions for your faith, as we heard last week from Nagame and her husband Saeed. This word tribulations or trials can mean all of these difficult situations that most of us are going through even presently in our lives. And Paul says to rejoice in these tribulations. Now that is a common theme that's found throughout the Bible. As you look, for example, in John 16, 33, from the lips of Jesus himself, he said, I have said these things to you that you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulations, difficulties, loneliness, rejection, problems. That will happen to you as my followers. There are no shortcuts to moving in a deep relationship with Jesus that denies those kind of difficulties. But Jesus also said, take heart, I have overcome the world. 
Then we also read in James, the first chapter, verse 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Not if you meet them, but when they come your way. They come to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 12, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Then we also see in this next text, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. From Acts 14, Paul's instructing new converts, new believers about this reality, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. What a powerful verse. Every new convert, every one of you who comes to faith in Jesus needs to be taught from the very beginning that you will not be immune from suffering and pain. You will have it. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. Every person who lives in Christ, every person who lives, has difficult times, and we are to be rejoicing in them. And finally, Psalm 119.71 says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. So there is a consistent theme throughout the Bible that those people who love God, those people who are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, will have times of tribulation, will have times of trial. But we are called to rejoice amidst those times of trial. It's a common theme. So when they come, usually there are two kinds of responses that we can give to those difficult times. First of all, we can have anxiety, fretting, moroseness, irritation, isolation, rebellion, anger at God, or the other alternative is to rejoice, to rejoice. Now, this is not a grin and bear it kind of rejoicing. This rejoicing is a deep, heartfelt feeling of love toward the Father in heaven who oversees the trial. It is not saying God is the author of the trial, for God's not the author of evil. When Gentry and Hadley Eddings lost their two boys several months ago, God was not the author of the loss of those two lives. Uh, When my dear friend Max Bumgarner, who is the COO of Forest Hill Church, and I depend on for a lot of insights into leadership here, when, for example, he went through a cancer problem this summer, and it almost took his life, and I can remember visiting him and seeing his sunken eyes and his near uh, raspy breath, he was not given that cancer by God. God is not the author of that cancer that he experienced, but when Paul tells us here to rejoice in our trials, what he's saying to Gentry and Hadley, and what he's saying to Max, and what he's saying to you and me when we go through those trials, that we don't rejoice because the trial's from God, we rejoice in the midst of that trial because we know the eternal God of this universe, who is good, is with us and overseeing that trial in some way we can't begin to understand. My son played basketball for some years, and When he was in high school, he had a remarkably gifted high school coach who would correct the players at different times to make them better players. And one time I remember my son going to him saying, you seem to be getting on me a lot. And the coach responded, yes, I am getting uh, getting on you a lot, and that's because I really see the potential that's in you. And he said, the day you should really wonder about me and you and our relationship is the day I quit getting on you. The day we should really worry is the day we stop having trials because that means we are ready to go to heaven. God is using those trials in specific, powerful ways to help accomplish his purposes in our lives and for his glory. In the midst of the trials, we rejoice because we know the good God of this universe is with us in those trials. So, What does rejoicing in these trials produce? Um, I think there's a divine rationale behind the suffering that we go through. It's like a ladder Paul outlines here. We rejoice 
in our tribulations, the next step up the ladder that moves us more toward God is enduring. Somehow rejoicing in those trials causes endurance, Paul said. And then the next rung up the ladder is that endurance causes proven character. And we'll look at endurance and proven character in just a moment. Then we'll see over the next two weeks that God then, the next rung produces hope, patience in our lives. And then the next and final rung is he produces love. The most preeminent of all of the virtues, he produces love in our hearts, poured out within us through the Holy Spirit. But for today, let's look at this whole idea of rejoicing in our sufferings that produces endurance, that produces perseverance. Uh, The word endurance is hupomeno. Uh, The word meno means abide. Uh, For those of you who know your Bibles, you know John 15, Jesus says, abide in me as I abide in you. Uh, For apart from me, you can do nothing. The whole idea is that our lives are totally immersed in him and his life is totally immersed in ours and we have this intimate, personal, dynamic, living relationship with him. So that's the meno part. We abide in him. Hupo means under. So perseverance is hupomeno, means we're under abiding, that when pressure comes upon us, we still choose to abide in Jesus, and somehow the pressure, the tribulation, is allowing us to grow closer and closer to the one we know as Lord and Savior. Said another way, when the trials come our way, you can either choose to be bitter or better. You, you can choose to be bitter, isolate, anger, rebellion, or you can choose to be better, move closer and closer to the one who is somehow overseeing the trial itself. God is more concerned, folks, with our journeys here on this side of eternity than our destination. Yes, he wants all of us in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord, but he's more concerned with what we learn during our time here in our destination. He wants us to learn the message of the importance of endurance and perseverance. He wants us to learn the power of hupomeno, to abide under the problems of our lives. Somehow this endurance message, this perseverance learning is important for us to learn on this side of eternity. Now, people who aren't even a part of the faith in Jesus Christ understand the importance of perseverance. Uh, For example, Sylvester Stallone of Rocky fame, wrote the script to Rocky, and he took it to multiple different movie studios. They laughed at the script. They thought it was ridiculous. He finally finally found one studio that was willing to do the movie, but he said, the only way I'll do it is if I'm Rocky. The studio said, no way. They thought maybe Harrison Ford might be a good Rocky. They said, no way, you can't be Rocky. He took the script and left. He kept shopping it to no avail. Finally, he went back to that same studio and said, would you still be interested in it, but I've still got to be Rocky. They said, okay, you can be Rocky, but you must take a much smaller portion of our contract negotiations because we were going to get a bigger name. He agreed to do it. Took a very small salary for him playing Rocky. Well, the movie producers didn't think it would be much of a movie, and here we are, Many years later, with not only Rocky One, but Rocky Two and Rocky Three, and Sylvester Stallone was the one who allowed himself in his contract to receive not only the benefits from Rocky One, but all the benefits from any movie that would come thereafter based on Rocky One. The producer said there won't be a number two or three, and here we are, Rocky Five and Six, and I understand that soon there will come out another movie called Creed. It's Rocky Balboa, now much older, who is taking Apollo Creed's son, the first boxer in Rocky One that Rocky fought about, and trying to Teach him how to win the championship himself. And Rocky has now earned over a billion dollars through the Rocky movies. Sylvester Stallone refused to give up. He persevered, and ultimately, success came his way. Margaret Thatcher, the famous prime minister of England, once said, you may have to fight the battle more than once to win it. How true. Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of England during World War II and one of my favorite leaders in all of the history of the world, graduated in the bottom third of his high school class. He had a speech impediment, but he refused to give up on going after his dreams of being a great leader in Western civilization. Churchill once said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. (laughs) 
<laughs> what a great statement. If you're going through hell, don't stop. He also was asked to go back to his high school where he graduated in the bottom third of his class after he was one of the world's greatest leaders in World War II, saving Western civilization from Nazi Germany. And here's the speech he gave to that high school class. He said, never give in, never give in, never, never, never In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except in convictions of honor and good sense. By the way, if you don't know, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister of England at the age of 65. For those of us who are getting a bit older, we are never supposed to retire. We're supposed to refire in perseverance for continuing to try to advance the kingdom of God. Bill Gates, the multi-billionaire in America today, did you know that before Microsoft, he headed up an organization called Trafadata? Trafadata. I guess you didn't know that, did you? Why? Because it went belly up. It was of no success. It was a total flop, but he didn't give up. He kept working and working until he produced Microsoft. Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company, filed for bankruptcy two times before he became the founder of the Ford Motor Company. Steve Jobs once said, what separates one half of unsuccessful entrepreneurs from successful ones is perseverance. J.K. Rowling, who was the founder of the whole Harry Potter theory series, presented her idea for these books 12 different times to 12 different publishers all the time being rejected by each one. Finally, someone offered her $2,000 as a book deal, which is a pittance of an amount for an author. She agreed to it. You know now the rest of the story. Her multiple hundreds of millions of dollars she's earned through the Harry Potter series. Elvis Presley, in 1954, after a performance at the Grand Old Opry, had one of the heads of that organization come to him and say, Buddy, you ain't going nowhere. You ought to go back and keep on driving a truck. Presley was devastated. He drove back that night to Memphis thinking his musical career was over. But he kept on moving forward. He later said, when things go wrong, don't go with them. He kept on trying. He kept persevering. And he has become one of rock and roll's greatest artists ever. Charles Spurgeon, who's considered the prince of preachers, once said, by perseverance, the nail, the snail, reached the ark. Helen Keller, who was blind at birth and persevered through all of her adversities to become a marvelous person in the history of humankind, once said, we can do anything we want to if we stick to it. Did you know this statistic about sales, that If a salesperson goes and tries to sell one time and stops, that represents 48% of the sales force. If you go two times and stop, that represents 25% of the sales force. If you go three times and stop, that represents 15% of the sales force. Yet 12% continue to go out over and over and over again and won't accept no for an answer. Those 12% represent 80% of all sales. They know the power of perseverance. Lou Gehrig, who for years before Cal Ripken broke the um, record in Major League Baseball of the most consecutive games played, um, when they finally had him stop playing because he just couldn't keep on playing, they did some x-rays of his body, and they found out that he had 17 different broken bones in the history of his long streak. He persevered. He continued to play no matter what. That's why they nicknamed him the Iron Man of Baseball. Vince Lombardi, the famous NFL football coach, said, the harder you work, the more likely you are not to surrender. Bear Bryant, the famous coach at Alabama, once said, if a man is a quitter, I'd rather find out in practice than in a game. And Mike Tyson, the infamous Boxer once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So true. And when we get punched in the face, we are supposed to persevere, to endure, to keep on keeping on. And somehow God wants us to learn that lesson. We are to rejoice in our trials and tribulations, all the problems that come to us, believing that in the midst of them there's God, and God is teaching us through the rejoicing endurance. 
the importance for learning how to endure in those difficult situations. So, so what in the world may be God trying to teach us in the enduring? Here's what the scripture tells us. The next rung up the ladder is through the endurance we learn proven character. Proven character. Now, now what's character? Character is who you are when no one's looking. Character is being the same person outside as you are inside. It's being the same person publicly and privately. Being a person of character means that your yes is yes and your no is no. You say what you mean and you mean what you say. The opposite of character is hypocrisy. You are duplicitous. You pretend to be one, two, three more different people than you really are. But character is a person upon whom you can depend. And God wants our eternal character built here on this side of eternity. Indeed, as I've shared with you before, God is much more concerned with our eternal character than he is our earthly comfort. He wants us to develop this character quality in our life. And in one of the translations in the Bible, it says that rejoicing in our suffering that produces endurance then produces proven character, proven character. That means that the character that has been under the pressures, under the trials, under the tribulations, under the difficulties has been proven. That who you really are has been shown to be a deep, abiding follower of Jesus. It's shown that his life is truly in you and your life is truly in his, him. That there, that relationship is really there. You see, trials and tribulations show what's really inside of us. For example, if you take a tube of toothpaste and you have it here and you start to squeeze it, what comes out? When you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, what comes out? You got it, toothpaste. And it's only through the squeezing that you find out what's really inside. I could tell you that there's soap inside this tube, but it's in the squeezing that proves that there's toothpaste actually inside. So, so, dear friends, do you see what God does? He allows the tribulations, trials, loneliness, disappointments, discouragements of the world, at least partially to prove our character, to put fingers around our lives to try to show us what's really in our hearts. If your heart is filled with anger, bitterness, resentment, comparison, envy, strife, all kinds of ungodliness. If that's there, it's in the trial that you see what's inside. So God allows the trials to occur. So he and you, and maybe even others, can see what was truly inside your heart. Proven character. You can say to me all day long, I believe in Jesus. He's Lord of my life. He lives inside of my life. The first thing that will expose it is trials, tribulations, difficulties. Then you really see what's inside of you. In fact, engineers, when they build cars after they've been completed, perform what's called stress tests. And they put the car under extreme stress, sometimes vibrating it to incredible degrees. Why? to see what might fall apart inside. It's important in order to sell the car and have a good product to give a stress test to it. The same is true with cardiologists. They bring you into the office and they put you under a stress test where your heart has to beat real fast. Why? Because they hate you and they like to make you exercise? No, they wanna see if your heart is healthy. God says rejoice in tribulations, believing he's in there with you because in that through your endurance, you'll be able to see proven character. You'll be able to see what is really in your heart. More so, when you have these trials and tribulations come to you, they drive you deeper in Christ. Uh, my friend Max Baumgartner, with his cancer, almost died in that ICU place in the hospital. But Max has now come back, praise God, and he would tell you today if he was on this platform, that that experience drove him into a deeper place in Christ than he's ever been before. And he would say to you that he wouldn't change it for the world. 
Though it was painful, though many of us, especially his family, were on the edge wondering if he would make it, he would say, I would not change that experience I had in that ICU unit with that cancer because it brought me into a more intimate place with Jesus than I've ever been before. In fact, let me give you this illustration. This particular block is God. And this nail is you and me. And this hammer are the tribulations, trials, difficulties, loneliness, disappointments, discouragements, despairs of this world. And we may be in God a little bit, but what he wants us to be is all in. Like that poker game where you're asked, are you all in or not? God asked all of us, are you all in? And though he didn't author the trials and tribulations, he uses them. God oversees Satan. He, he may be Satan, but he's God's Satan. He may be the devil, but he's the Lord's devil. That's clear in Job, the first chapter, and Luke 22. Satan can't do anything unless God somehow permissively oversees his life. So if the evil one allows trials or sends trials and tribulations to us, God has another plan. And as he hammers us and hurts us, and it does cause us pain, the attitude that God wants us to have is to rejoice with every single hit. Because if we really are in Christ, if we've been justified in him by grace through faith, that means that our lives have been driven deeply into Christ. In, in Colossians language in the Bible, we've been hidden in Christ. He's our life. He's our hope. He's our sufficiency. He surrounds us. We are in him at the very roots of who he is. We're abiding in him, and he's abiding in us. And that's where we're going to be in heaven. And God begins now that process of teaching us how to make Christ our life. Not just an addendum, not an appendage. He's our life. That's why we rejoice even in our suffering. Seasoned soldiers win battles. In fact, let me ask you this question. With a game on the line in sports, who do you want in that tight, pressured situation? A rookie or a veteran? Uh, let's go back to last Monday night when the Carolina Panthers are playing <laughs> the Indianapolis Colts, and it goes into overtime, and the Panthers get an interception and, and move down to around the 35-yard line, and if they kick the field goal, they'll win the game. Now, now who comes into the game? J.J. Jansen, the long snapper, Brad Nortman, the field goal holder and the punter, and Graham Gano, the field goal kicker. And by the way, all three of them are Forest Hillers. JJ and Brad come to the South Park campus, and Graham goes to the Fort Mill campus. So they're all followers of Jesus. I mean, even Graham talked about how he went on the field knowing that this was the first time he was ever in the position of kicking a game-winning field goal. And he held his hands out like this and said, Lord, this is your situation. I'm trusting you explicitly. Brad told me how he just gave it to the Lord. JJ, the same thing. And as we watched that game at 12... 15 in the morning, and Graham kicked that field goal perfectly through the uprights, and the Carolina Panthers won the game and have now gone to 7-0. and Isn't that great news? And we bring on the Green Bay Packers this weekend, okay? Let me ask you this question. In that situation, for that game-winning field goal, would you want uh, three rookies on the field who'd never done it before? Or would you want three veterans like J.J., Brad, and Graham kicking that field goal? God wants us to be veterans. He wants us to grow up in Christ. He wants us to mature in Christ. He wants us to be complete in Christ. And it's through rejoicing and suffering that causes endurance, that then causes proven character, that proves we're veterans, that proves we're able to be in the situation to kick the field goal, to win the game for God's glory. God is concerned about our eternal 
character, folks, and the way he proves whether we're on the right trajectory to heaven is through difficult trials and tribulations. So therefore, when trials come your way, don't quit. Don't give up. Even the world knows the importance of perseverance, but take it a step further. Rejoice in it. Thank God in it. Because though God's not the author of it, God is in the situation with you. And you rejoice with him in the midst of the problem, believing that God is working it for our good and his glory. In fact, one final point. When Jesus called all of us, the words in the Bible are, follow me. Jesus said to all of us, follow me. You realize that in Jesus' life, he went through loneliness, betrayal, Rejection, physical pain on the cross, spiritual pain, feeling abandonment from his Father in heaven. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out on the cross. All of those human experiences, trials, tribulations Jesus went through. Dear friends, the pupil is not greater than the master. And what Jesus went through, we will go through too. But listen to these verses. Let me ask you now, in fact, to stand as we conclude this message. Jesus said, Matthew 24, 13, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. If you believe at the end of your life, that proves you've truly been saved. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He looked at the joy of the cross set before him. And finally, from 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Don't give up. Persevere. As you rejoice in the tribulation, knowing that God's produced a character within you, that will last forever. To him and alone always belongs the glory. Amen.